Hello and welcome to this episode of Joy of Science, a research matters podcast bringing you the stories behind exciting research endeavors. I'm your host Spurti Raman talking to Professor Sumana Anagiri, our guest for today. Professor Anagiri is the principal investigator of the Ant Lab at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Kolkata. She has been studying the behavior of ants since a decade and her lab has uncovered some interesting facts about an Indian species of ant called Diacama indica which was previously unknown to science. Professor Anagiri, thank you so much for joining and thank you for your time. Welcome to this episode of Joy of Science. So to start with, um, as kids, we've all um, seen ants, been with, you know, uh, probably disturbing a few ants and playing with a few ants, etc. And that's probably some of us may have been bitten with uh, by ants or stinged by ants. And that's kind of, you know, uh, what ant really comes up when we talk to most of us. So what, what motivated you to study ants? Uh, yes, we've all encountered ants. Um, we have done a uh, few nasty things to them as well. Uh, you typically not want a trail of ants in your kitchen, taking away food material uh, that you like yourself. Uh, but uh, this is just one side of the lives of ants. Uh, there are a large variety of ants, about 12,500 species across the world. And uh, a large number of them live in our country right along with us. And we have almost no idea of what their lives are. So I was interested in understanding how ants will move their homes from one location to another while carrying hundreds of other nestmates and all the young ones, that is the brood of the colony, from one place into another. Uh, that was my primary motivation, having relocated myself uh, from the US to India, uh, I saw this relocation occur literally at my doorstep and it was so fascinating and I was anyway interested about interest, uh, insects and that's when I started working on this. Wow, this is really an interesting story. Um, yes, relocation is stressful. Uh, maybe we'll come to a little later on, you know, understanding how ants really deal with it. But then before that, uh, you mentioned that there are about 12,500 different species of ants in, in the world. and how well do we know Indian ants and do you can you give us like a snapshot of how many species could be here and considering this is a tropical country I'm assuming there could be a lot of varieties and uh, yes most of us know as black ants, red ants and ants that bite and ants that don't and what, what does science say about it at the moment? Uh, I am not aware actually of how many species are present in our country because we have very uh, less literature on this. Uh, the ballpark number would be certainly higher than 2000 species. There are possibly three people in the entire country uh, of such a large number of humans who have uh, even attempted to document the number of ants that are present in our country. Um, so that is the only ballpark that I can give right now, more than about 2000 for sure. Cool. So that's quite quite an impressive number and we it's sad that we don't really know anything about most of them. Uh, talking a little, you know, um, in depth about your uh, specific ant of interest, Diacama indica, what are those some of those features that are very special to this particular ant? Okay, uh, Diacama indicum uh, is a species of ant that's only found in India, Sri Lanka, um, in this uh, region only. And uh, the highlight for this, uh, for, for a research point of view, is that the colony sizes are quite small by ant standards. Uh, it's in the hundreds. And this allows me to be able to mark every individual uh, ant and follow their behavior at an individual level. So we can figure out exactly what ants are doing uh, in a given task. Uh, and that is what made me pick Dacama indicum. This is also a species that is there uh, in Bengal where I work. Uh, that is a second reason. It's always useful to have this focal species in your vicinity. And the third uh, feature is that it is relatively easy to collect this species of ant. It is. Uh, relatively easy to maintain them in the lab and when you want to do rigorous scientific experiments uh, sample sizes are particularly important and it would be easier to work with species that are available in abundance. 
yeah makes sense total sense um you you said a very interesting point saying you want to individually mark ants can you just give us a you know thought about how you do it and uh, uh, you know what's what's behind you know marking them and uh, feeding them storing in the lab what it, what does it all entail marking them really is the first step of our research uh, because like you would have seen uh, most ants are either black or red to us and uh, their bodies are identical adult ants do not grow um, they have a fixed uh, body um length and width and so forth and they are very similar to each other so if you are interested in what ants do what their lives are about then you would have to first delineate one individual from another and the only way to do this is to mark them with enamel paint on different parts of their body so for us an ant is not just an ant but it's a roll number that we give them or an identity that we give them and on a daily basis we take census of the colony to see whether the ants that we have marked are there what are they doing uh, for how long do they do the things that uh, they are going to be doing so this would be the beginning of quantitative research on the lives of ants uh, we collect these colonies from the natural habitat and maintain them in small plastic boxes within our laboratories in an artificial nest that is made of uh, plaster of paris and a small petri plate uh, we keep them typically for about 10 15 days and then release them back into the natural habitat um and and most of your research or your lab's research has been focused on you know relocation of ants so moving from one nest to another nest uh you did explain that you know the mom- moment when you had to relocate was something that inspired you to take up relocation as a you know uh, 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 as a re- uh, area of research for you or an area of interest for you on these ant studies but from an ants perspective in an ants life how big is this event of relocation and why so yes uh, literally when i moved here uh, i saw a colony of dacama indica moving into a flower pot inside my house uh, and then when i uh, looked into the scientific literature i found that there is ha- hardly any information on how colonies relocate and this is unlike a uh, job that ants would be doing on a daily basis for example foraging where they would go on a daily basis outside their nest a few ants to get food or building material that they require and come back into the nest whereas relocation is a goal oriented task this uh, has to be an occupation that has a very clear start and it has a clear ending when all of the colony mates reach to the new nest so the manner in which this is organized and the manner in which it is conducted will directly impact the reproductive ability of the colony as well as its survival so i thought that this would be a fantastic platform on which to study various aspects of division of labor in this uh, species and uh, look at it both in the natural habitat of these ants as well as within controlled laboratory settings and contrast these findings to understand the process of relocation itself uh, which has been documented very little bit and we are the first ones to be doing it in the entire world in the natural habitat wow that is really impressing and i'm sure when you mentioned about laboratory settings uh, you you did explain about how you store ants and everything so what does a typical day look like in your lab for you and for your students um a lot of uh, what we really like to do is observations uh, look at the level of the organism and try to give them challenging tasks to do and figure out how they're performing it if they can do it at all uh, and that's what we would like the whole day to be about however uh, in practical terms there are a lot of uh, things that we have to do in addition um, the analysis of what we have recorded in our observation takes about three times of the time that is required for observation so it it's a lot of statistics of modeling that is required a lot of video types that have to be decoded uh, in order to be able to quantitatively say with statistical significance that something is happening and that journey is a lot more rigorous than just making a mere observation you know as you're walking in your park uh, so that journey is something that one has to learn how to do it and be truly fascinated 
in order to have sustained levels of motivation to do that True. that is what my students would be facing as a challenge i'm sure <laughs> So yeah this is like an interesting point where you say perseverance is important you need to have that a level of motivation not just observe how it's happening in the park get all the more excited and elated and say okay i want to replicate in the you know uh, lab and see okay and write a paper about uh, you know these behaviors and stuff so what are those typical moments of despair or uh, disappointments that students who are enthusiastic about behavior ecology or animal behavior really phase in in you know probably our lab but on a general uh, context yeah. uh, so yeah the biggest frustration uh, for most uh, researchers in this area is seasonality so uh, when you're tracking individual organisms uh, or uh, their nests in the natural habitat you really have to have the patience and the planning to do it when it is amicable to the creature of interest uh, it is not something that's in a petri plate and you decide at 9 am in the morning that i will do this experiment it is something that the organisms would decide for you as to when you can do a particular experiment or you cannot do these observations so learning that and being able to appreciate the natural habitat in which these organisms live and ask meaningful questions from this can become quite frustrating uh, for people who are not exposed uh, to ecology and behavior category of uh, research and uh, yes uh, when you talk about ants specifically uh, yes as i mentioned people are going to be bitten by it some people may be scared of ants uh, but still want to know about it and uh, in the lab obviously you you said you will get a colony and then you know track that etc so how do you prevent ant bites in the lab we take the precaution of wearing a simple pair of plastic gloves and that is sufficient for the species of interest uh, which is another highlight from our point of view the creatures that uh, we work with dicama indicum are scavengers and they are not predatory in nature so they are not extremely aggressive which helps us do the day to day activities and the pain that we cause them but uh, in general uh, it's best to maintain distance uh, from the ants there are some that bite some that sting some that spray acid on you and so forth but uh, that is the way that they can survive and face predators in their natural habitat so the best solution would be uh, to maintain distance and watch them from a dis- uh, from a reasonable distance uh, instead of provoking them to come and investigate what is bothering them <laughs> sure and then get bitten and then blame the ants no yes. <laughs> they are not supposed to be yes. the ones to be blamed yes. um and yes ants have been around for maybe millions of years and they surely have a role to play in our surroundings on this planet in fact uh, david attenborough had done a very beautiful documentary just featuring these carpenter ants uh, i'm sure that's in the temperate regions not somewhere close by but then in your view um, for a country like india what ecological roles do these tiny creatures really play all right so uh, ants have a extremely important role in the ecosystem uh, they've been here for about 140 million years um, the dinosaurs arrived on earth and disappeared uh, the ants were there before that and they continue to exist here so they have got many features right in the manner of survival in the manner of adapting to the changes that the uh, environment has given to them uh, they ants are one of the groups of uh, creatures which have a position in all the strata of the food pyramid uh, except of course the producers so they can be primary consumers they can be secondary consumers they can also be scavengers and they help in decomposing of a great deal of uh, material in the uh, environment further they also act as uh, farmers because they rear aphids which is part of the ecosystem uh next they are very good pest controllers as they attack termites and get rid of them in addition they do work as pollinators uh the amount of uh, crop produced by a plant which is protected by ants is larger then once where ants are not there to defend the plant from predators so the relationship that ants have with the ecosystem is quite diverse um, and this 
is not as well studied as what honey bees would uh, be would have been uh, receiving attention for but uh, the ants certainly have a very important role and they're good in adapting to the changes that are present in the environment thank you ma'am i think that is really uh, eye opening to learn that a lot of ants are helpful in pollination because when somebody says pollination the obvious ones are going to be the butterflies the honey bees and uh, pretty much the con- conservation efforts towards you know pre- preserving pollinators have been you know conserving these species and uh, often in a garden ants are the most probably overlooked because they're just there and to know that they actually control pests and save your garden from being eaten away by by other insects that you don't want them to be eaten by i think this is this is great just to add to that list uh, they also turn around a great deal of soil so next to the earthworms ants are considered as the second most important uh, turners of soil such that the nutrients can be recycled mm-hmm. uh, in the soil so uh, that is another contribution that ants would be making to the ecosystem okay then i think if you have a garden ants are your best friends yeah. keep them there keep them safe um so when ants are doing such a great deal for the planet for us what are some of the things that we can learn from ants are there any lessons that you have and you know discovered to say okay lessons for life um uh, well i am typically wary of uh, thinking of uh, taking lessons directly from the creatures that we uh, study or imposing our values on the creatures that we study because both of this um would lead us in the wrong path uh, in terms of the scientific discovery and value that we attach to what we find so in general uh, the general the saying is that ants are extremely hard working behave like an ant and so forth uh, however having studied ants at their home for long periods of time i uh, i would not agree that all ants are extremely hard working uh, there are many ants uh, and the biological clock or their system is similar to other creatures and they would also rest and take a break as much as what other organisms do i'm sure so if you see ants scurrying around and they're working hard that is simply 10% of the colony whereas the 90% of the remaining ants are inside the nest possibly resting or doing other housekeeping jobs that are inside the nest so it would be too far fetched for us to simply say or come to a conclusion based on very limited information we would have to study the ants a lot more mm-hmm. uh in order to understand and appreciate what their lives in detail sure and i'm sure you're taking the first step and i'm sure the listeners are also going to be mesmerized by all these information that you've shared with us today the question back to you then is before you began all your studies um you would have probably had some hypothesis of what ants were capable of uh, and now 10 year, years down the lane um are there any traits or any specific qualities that have surprised you excited you or disappointed you from where you started i was working on other social insects before i started ants and when i first saw the relocation i thought okay this seems uh, quite simple uh, it should be decipherable maybe 6 months a year maybe 5 years i should certainly be done with answering things that are related to relocation but after having worked on it for about 11 years not just by myself but with the support and uh, the great dedication and enthusiasm of my students um we find that in our lab we have really just seen the first 10% of the challenges that relocation offers to a creature that is uh, really really small with a tiny brain less than 1 mm so uh this itself is a humongous uh, i would not say a surprise but it is a challenge mm-hmm. because i started off being quite simplistic about it and i find that even understanding a, one aspect in the life of a creature takes humongous amount of time and effort and even in my lifetime if i can understand all relocation aspects about one species that itself would be quite fulfilling true and 
this is exciting for a lot of listeners i'm sure to find out that you know a lot of our organisms around us um, from ants to probably elephants don't really have a simple decipherable life they have a lot of complexities going on and there are there's this budding um, you know a group of animal behavior enthusiasts trying to you know uh, either read up on this or pursue it as an academic career and things like that so is there like a small message that you want to share about being in this field for so long about how and what to expect and what to look forward in the field of animal behavior research it's very important for humans the next generation of uh, students whether they're in the school or colleges to try and stay in tune with nature um increasingly we are becoming so urbanized that we are losing touch with where we started off from so if you get a chance go to a park uh, go to a wildlife reserve and you know be there i mean just try to keep your eyes and mind and ears open to other living creatures that are there right with us and try to think of how fascinating their lives are that is a very nice way to be encouraging uh scientific stat inquiry that's the beginning of scientific inquiry mm-hmm. and this is a field that does not require a great deal of background knowledge in order to start your research or start experimenting with we have all experimented with putting water down ant colonies uh when you were a kid and it was great fun to do just to see what happens and that basic curiosity is what drives humans the passion that we have for following what happens is what determines the path that we take thank you ma'am this is wonderful i think um, at least there will be some portion of the listeners who are going to be fascinated considering we have we have as you pointed out seeming to lose regards for animals and other beings that are coexisting with us so the mo- the first step probably is to appreciate what they are capable of and then to realize how much they impact our lives in different ways if that's possible so thank you so much for your time and this is an interesting uh, conversation i'm sure um and um, i hope this episode will inspire people to look a lot differently and a lot lot um, maturely at ants rather than simply playing with them being destructive and to just back off and see oh yeah this is something i can relate to and an observation that i think is interesting so thank you ma'am thank you for being a great guest on this episode of joy of science and um, with that we sign off okay thanks for having me in and uh, keep your curiosity up <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you that's a great ending note. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. We will be back soon with another episode of Research Bites. This podcast was brought to you by Research Matters, a Psychom initiative by Kubi Labs. For more such podcasts and science news, log on to www.researchmatters.in. Until next time, stay tuned.